Okay, uh, first, um, immediately after this lecture, please go to, um, directly to the outside amphitheater for the group picture. Okay, so um, as soon as it's done, just find your way to the amphitheater. Um, and uh, my second announcement um, is one that I'm, I'm happy to make. Uh, the, M the Mises Institute presents the uh, 2024 Gary G. Schlarbaum Award to a promising young scholar for excellence in research and teaching. Um, and it's hereby presented to Matt McCaffrey, which, who is our speaker. Thank you so much to, to Joe Salerno for this entirely uh, unexpected uh, award. I really appreciate it, and I'm very grateful to uh, to Gary Schlarbaum for for sponsoring it. Uh, I would, I think, differ with uh, with Joe over his description of me as a young scholar, but you know, I'll take what I can get. Uh, thank you, obviously, to the Mises Institute and to Joe Salerno for inviting me to give this lecture. I have to say, this for me is really the fulfillment of a a long time dream I've had going back many, many years to the first time I attended Mises University, which is nearly 20 years ago. And uh, I'm when Joe Salerno was speaking last night about those uh, the young students who let later on come back uh, to uh, to teach at Mises University, I have to say I really felt that because for me, that first Mises University that I attended was a really a genuinely transformative experience. I mean, it, it quite literally changed the entire course of my life. And so to be able to come now, uh, to come back now and then speak to you uh, and give one of these uh, introductory uh, plenary lectures is just a, it's a tremendous privilege. And so I'm very grateful to the Mises Institute for the opportunity. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I know this is the last lecture of the day. And so I'm the, la the only thing between you and dinner. And I know you just had to listen to Newman talk for an hour. So your attention spans are already, are already quite low. Um, but I'm really happy to, uh, to be able to speak to you this afternoon about uh, entrepreneurship, which is uh, an area of particular interest for me. It's where I do a lot of my teaching and my research. And just to start off, I want to uh, make a point about entrepreneurship and the way that it's perceived in sort of the public mind. And I think if you asked sort of random people in the street to name an entrepreneur, probably they would name somebody like Elon Musk or maybe Jeff Bezos or one of these types of people, you know, billionaires, the richest people in the world, people with the, you know, business people with these big public profiles and so on. And I think this is a, you know, entrepreneurship has now been kind of a buzzword for a very long time, so long that like most buzzwords, it's sort of lost its meaning uh, or rather it just means whatever you want it to mean. Um, and I think, so, you know, uh, Musk would be a good example of that because I think if you ask people what makes somebody like Elon Musk entrepreneurial, they would, you get a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different answers. People would say, well, he founds a lot of companies and he invests in a lot of emerging technologies or, you know, he's out there, he's trying to change the world, you know, by, uh, by buying uh, Twitter or X or whatever. Um, and in a way, all of those things are part of what it means to be an entrepreneur when we talk about what entrepreneurship is from an economic perspective. Yes, we do often mean these kinds of things. But as, I, as I'll explain as we go along, all of these things are in a way part of what it means to be an entrepreneur, but they don't capture the big picture uh, or the, the, the true fuller picture of what it means to be an entrepreneur. And that fuller picture in a way is actually maybe more profound, but also more mundane in a way than the impression that you get if you look only at these sort of outlier examples, the, the Elon Musks uh, of the world and so on. So it's, it's more profound in the sense that entrepreneurs genuinely do change the world in, in a sense. They, they play this absolutely crucial role in shaping the market economy, improving living standards and improving human welfare and so on. So they're absolutely indispensable in that sense. Uh, but entrepreneurship is also more mundane in the sense that, um, again, once you get away from the outliers, in practice, entrepreneurship is very often an unromantic path in life. Um, yes, it can lead to, to fame and fortune, uh, but for many more people, it leads to financial ruin and, you know, it can uh, take a toll on your mental, mental and physical health and all kinds of things like this. So being an entrepreneur is, is very often a, a rather unromantic 
uh, line of work to be in. And as we go along, I'm going to explain a little bit more what the Austrians have thought, uh, have said about entrepreneurship and this role it plays and talk a little bit more um, about both the profound and the mundane aspects of it. So it's always good to begin with a Mises quote. Uh, and this little bit from Mises here is actually one of his more famous turns of phrase, um, the idea that the entrepreneur is the driving force of the whole market system. Um, you'll see Austrian economists quote this phrase quite a lot when discussing entrepreneurship. Uh, Israel Kirzner actually has a whole book called The Driving Force of the Market, which is a, a reference and a sort of a tribute to what Mises is saying here. And I bring this up for two reasons. The first is that this sets the tone for a lot of what I'll discuss in the rest of the lecture, and particularly the idea of the centrality of the entrepreneur in the economic process. This is something crucial in Austrian economics, as emphasized by Mises here, um, and for, for reasons that I'll explain as we go along. Um, the second reason I want to raise this is because uh, in previous years, when Peter Klein gave this lecture, he also used this quote. Um, but he cited it incorrectly. It's actually on, it's on page 249 of Human Action. It's not on page 248, as he alleges. So, okay. so I want to talk about why Mises would make this rather bold, ambitious claim about the importance of entrepreneurship. And in doing that, I first want to mention that um, in saying this, Mises was not uh, making an entirely original statement. He did, was not the first person to claim this tremendous importance for entrepreneurs in the market process. He was building on several generations of previous writers just in the Austrian tradition, to say nothing of writers from outside the Austrian tradition, uh, going all the way back to Karl Menger. So virtually every major or minor figure in the Austrian tradition has written something about entrepreneurship. Many of them have written books or articles specifically dedicated to studying it in some way. Virtually everybody has written about it. And the reason, as we'll see, is, again, because entrepreneurship connects a lot of the key pieces of the economic puzzle. But going right back to the beginning. Now, I would guess that some of these faces will be familiar to you already. Uh, but I would also suppose, at least, that there are some who are perhaps less well known. Um, and I'm thinking particularly of the, the two men on the far left there, uh, right after Menger. I don't suppose anybody can identify either of those people. No? Well, well, I'll give you the one on the top left, I'll give you a hint. It's not Teddy Roosevelt, which is who it looks like. But um, these are on the top left, uh, Victor Mataja and below him, Gustav Gross. These are two of Karl Menger's earliest students who, in the early 1880s, uh, wrote the first two book length treatments of entrepreneurship and business profit, respectively, in the Austrian tradition. So, uh, as you remember, I hope from the, the lecture this morning, Menger's Principles was published in 1871. And barely a decade after that, his students are already publishing full length treatments of the entrepreneur. And that's a good indication of just how important this topic was to the Austrians going right back to the founding of the tradition. Right? And since then, virtually everyone else, um, ma major or minor, in the Austrian tradition has had something to say about the kind of problems that I'm going to be discussing. Right? Um, you can see here the, uh, the Americans sort of in the top right there, they sort of fade into color. Basically, the more color there is, the sort of less relevance there is to the... the, uh, the... Okay. So, I've said it already that the entrepreneur has a role of central importance in the Austrian tradition, but it, it's not just about the power of entrepreneurship in explaining how the real world market economy works. Entrepreneurship is also a key part of how Austrians do economics. And what I mean by that is that entrepreneurship is connected to virtually every key theory or concept in the body of Austrian economics, right? Going from the most basic concepts like action, building all the way up to the most complicated problems, economic growth and development, business cycles, and things like that. Entrepreneurship is connected intimately with all of these things. And we could put many, many more concepts up here as well, uh, but these are just some of the ones that I thought uh, were, were worth mentioning most today. Entrepreneurship connects them all. And in a sense, entrepreneurship 
uh, even gives meaning to these concepts. We can't really fully understand them without understanding what it is that entrepreneurs do. Because it's entrepreneurs who are acting and bearing uncertainty. It's entrepreneurs who are using money prices to engage in economic calculation and so on, right? And it's also not a coincidence that I put calculation at the center of this honeycomb because as you'll learn, I think in tomorrow morning's lecture about calculation, this is really the other side of the coin of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs use economic calculation as, a, as an indispensable tool for organizing the whole market economy. Uh, and so calculation is, and entrepreneurship are very much at the center of all of this. They connect to all of this and they bring it all together. So what exactly are we trying to get out of a theory of entrepreneurship? What are we trying to explore when we talk about this kind of thing? So for most Austrian economists, the idea of entrepreneurship comes down to the theory of income distribution. That's where it begins. Distribution, as the name implies, is who gets what in the market economy. How are the different incomes of different people determined? And for Austrians, as you've heard a little bit already, I think, and you'll learn much more about tomorrow, uh, it's all about different functions or roles that people play in society. Right? And so when we look at entrepreneurship, we're trying to figure out exactly what is the source of a particular income that we observe in the, out there in the real world, right? Because we observe incomes like wages and interest and so on, and we have derived uh, rules, we have derived principles that, are, that, inf that tell us how those prices are determined, right? But where does the unique entrepreneurial income fit in all of this? Because alongside wages and interest and so on, we also observe profit and loss. And profit and loss defy explanation according to any kind of strict rule or principle. Right? So this is the sort of riddle that we're trying to figure out ultimately is what exactly is it that causes entrepreneurial profit and loss? Now, um, I'm going to skip over some of this because I don't have time to go into it in great detail. But just for now, I want to say that the way that economists like Mises and Rothbard approached this sort of question was to reason using uh, what a kind of equilibrium construct, what Mises would call an imaginary uh, construct, which is just a, essentially just a thought experiment that we use to try and distinguish between different incomes and see what it is that makes entrepreneurship unique. And this construct is called the evenly rotating economy. It's a kind of Austrian equilibrium. It's a, it's a purely sort of hypothetical scenario that we use um, to try and figure out what makes entrepreneurs unique. Basically, the idea is that to figure out what entrepreneurship is, we try to imagine a world in which it doesn't exist. We try to figure out how we can define it away and then that, in turn, allows us to see a little bit more clearly what it is that, uh, that, that entrepreneurs do. Right? So in the evenly rotating economy, in this, this construct that Mises and Rothbard developed, um, what makes it unique is that uh, there is no uncertainty. So in the evenly rotating economy, uh, there is the passage of time, but we know what's going to happen in the future. Right? So we think about this, and again, this is quite an unrealistic, you know, this could never obtain in the real world, but that's not the point. The point is to use it as a foil to compare to the real world, to look at the unique aspects of what entrepreneurs do. So in the evenly rotating economy, we assume away the existence of uncertainty. We know what's going to happen in the future. We know what consumer preferences are going to be in the future. We know about the most efficient ways to use resources to satisfy consumers, and so on. So in this kind of scenario, what then happens to the different incomes that people earn? And the answer is um, they all remain in one way or another. You have uh, landlords who are supplying land to the, to the market. You have wage earners who are supplying their labor in the market. Those are, are strictly determined according to their marginal productivity. Right? I think Mark, Tar Mark Thornton will talk more about wages and, and productivity and so on um, in his lecture tomorrow. Uh, and then there's also uh, capitalists who are in interest according to time preference. Again, uh, I think Jeff Herbner will talk about this tomorrow as well. So this is a preview of a lot of what's come. But the point is that in this fictitious economy, there is no room for entrepreneurship and there is no room for profit and loss because all of the different possibility or possible sources of income have already been accounted for. And this one, this profit and loss, uh, doesn't seem to exist. And there's no real role for entrepreneurs. Right? So 
What does that ultimately tell us? Well, we compare this fictitious construct with the real world where there is uncertainty and when there is constant change. And then we begin to see this is what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are sort of agents of change. They're responsible for anticipating and reacting to all of the different changes and uncertainties that occur in the real world, right? So uh, again, I'll say this a few more times. Uh, tomorrow, I think Sean Rittenauer will talk more about capital and the capital structure. But um, one of the key themes there is that um, there is a constant need in society for somebody, entrepreneurs, to combine the different factors of production, right? We need to create goods and services to satisfy our wants. And the only way that we can do this is by uh, intensifying the division of labor, building a larger, more complex capital structure, and combining and constantly recombining land, labor, and capital, right? The key, re the key scarce resources uh, on which society depends. So somebody has to be responsible for constantly creating and recreating this structure of production. Right? And you can see this in a nice quote from uh, Ludwig Lachmann, where he says, we are living in a world of unexpected change. Capital combinations, and with them the capital structure, will be ever-changing, uh, will be dissolved and reformed. And in this activity, we find the real function of the entrepreneur. So Lachman is recognizing here very clearly that there is a constant need to respond to change in the market economy. And that means we're constantly rearranging how we use land, labor, capital, uh, or any scarce resource uh, in an effort to satisfy consumers. Because this is ultimately the purpose of all production, right? All production is ultimately in the surface of creating goods and services that will be sold to consumers. So obviously entrepreneurs don't just produce because they want to, because they like it. They do it because they want to satisfy consumers and in turn receive profits. So profits uh, in the market economy are a kind of reward, if you will, that consumers bestow upon successful entrepreneurs, on entrepreneurs who successfully anticipated what the future was going to be, what consumers were going to want a few days or weeks or years down the road. Right? So that's where profit comes with uh, comes from. I'll talk about the other side of that uh, in just a moment. So given that you can win enormous profits, fame and fortune and all that in the market economy, why are so few people entrepreneurs, right? Because this is a tiny minority, ultimately, uh, of people in society who prefer to, to be entrepreneurs, you know, to, to be sort of independent um, uh, and not just you just you know, seek employment um, with other people. So why is entrepreneurship so uncommon? Uh, and the answer, of course, is uncertainty. Now, I've hinted at this a few times already. Um, but the fact that the future is fundamentally uncertain is a crucial aspect of, of understanding what it is that entrepreneurs do. Now, economists have talked about this in different ways. I've got a picture here of Mises, but also of the uh, Chicago economist Frank Knight, both of whom developed accounts of uncertainty and its role in relation to entrepreneurship and human action. Um, and even though Knight wasn't sort of a card-carrying member of the Austrian school, his account very closely parallels uh, Mises. And in fact, he had in, he had published his book uh, in, uh, on this in, uh, in 1921. He had a very famous book called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, um, where he laid out um, his, uh, his theory of uncertainty and entrepreneurship. Um, and then later in Human Action, Mises comes along and makes a very much a parallel argument, um, but just using a different terminology. Right? Um, so what is uncertainty all about? So the, the crucial idea is that we never really know what's going to happen in the future. Nevertheless, there are some kinds of events that are more or less easy to predict. And this is what entrepreneurs really need to get right. right? So to understand what uncertainty is, again, it's useful to present it as a kind of a, a foil. right? And in this case, the foil uh, is what we call risk. Now, risk is sometimes confusingly used in discussions of entrepreneurship uh, because this distinction hasn't, in a way, sort of been fully appreciated. but. Um, from an economic perspective, there's a difference, a crucial difference between what we call risk and what we call genuine uncertainty, or sometimes Knightian uncertainty after Frank Knight, uh, or in Mises' case, what we might call case probability. Right? So the idea here is that risks are relatively easy to deal with. 
Again, we never really know what's going to happen in the future, but some events are very easy to classify and very easy to describe using conventional probability tools, right? So if you think, you know, like a great example of this would be things like games of chance, right? Flip of the coin, a uh, roll of the die, you know, a turn of the cards uh, in a game of blackjack or something like that. We don't know what the next roll of the die is going to come up, right? And we don't know what the next card the dealer is going to turn over is. However, these games have very clearly defined rules and a very clearly defined set of outcomes, right? So we don't know exactly what the die is going to show uh, or what the coin, what face of the coin is going to turn up, but we know, for instance, that the probability of, you know, uh, uh, turning heads um, is roughly, you know, is 50-50, right? So here we have risks, right? Very clearly defined rules and sets of outcomes. What's useful about uh, risks is that they can be pooled. And this is exactly what insurance does, right? You take these well-known risks where, again, you can't predict the outcome of an individual event, but you know that over time there's a sort of a well-defined probability distribution that you can identify. This is the heart and soul of what the insurance industry does is pool risks like this. So risks aren't really a problem for entrepreneurs, or for, for the market economy. Uncertainty is a problem because uncertainty is a more radical notion than risk. In the case of uncertainty, you don't have well-defined probabilities. You're dealing with events that are in some sense unique or that are highly heterogeneous, right? And therefore, they define groupings. They define classifications. And one of the big implications of that is that you can't really insure against genuine uncertainties. And then the punchline for entrepreneurs is that it turns out that basically everything in the world that matters for entrepreneurs is a matter of uncertainty and not risk, right? So the future state of consumer preferences, the future state of technological development, resource availabilities, whether or not you can get land, labor, and capital in the right proportions exactly when you want them, all of these things are fundamentally uncertain. And all of these things require entrepreneurs to make decisions on a daily basis, right? So this is the challenge of entrepreneurship, and this is exactly why so few people, so few people choose to be entrepreneurs, because when you're an entrepreneur, you're really sort of on your own. As I'll explain in a moment, you're really bearing the uncertainty of the future. You have to take responsibility for your own decisions. And for most people, that's just not a very good deal. Most people would prefer the safety and the security of, say, a steady wage over the possibility of, you know, of earning enormous fame and fortune. Uh, but also, you know, most people don't want to chance the downside of that, which is what happens when you fail. So this is another great quote from Mises where he talks about how universal uncertainty is and how essentially all action in a way involves a kind of speculation because we're constantly planning and acting in what we could call the present with a view to making ourselves better off at some point in the future. And as Mises points out, there's many a slip twixt cup and lip. So we constantly get this wrong. We make errors ourselves. We lack perfect information about the world. And as I said, the future is just fundamentally unpredictable in so many ways that are relevant for entrepreneurs working in the market economy. Okay. So again, um, what exactly is it that entrepreneurs do? So we can, uh, I'll use the, the term um, that I think is, is most apt, which is judgment. Right? So when we talk about entrepreneurs making decisions in, an in the face of an uncertain future, we're talking about the use of judgment. This is a term that's used by Frank Knight uh, and by many, many other economists working in this tradition. Um, recently, people like Peter Klein and Nikolai Foss have, um, have really um, developed this sort of strand of thinking in what's we, what we would call the, the judgment-based approach to entrepreneurship, which is essentially the modern Austrian tradition in entrepreneurship that takes into consideration um, so many of these contributions from all the, the thinkers that I had showed you, uh, showed you earlier. Right? So what judgment is essentially is the ability to make decisions in the face of uncertainty without having reference to a strict rule or guideline that can tell you how to behave. Right? So there is no uh, strict sort of decision function that can guide your action. Again, you're sort of on your own. You have to figure it out by yourself. Right? Now, a crucial part of this is that, in a way, as Mises says, 
everything is uncertain. And we're all constantly having to sort of confront uncertainty in one way or another. But a vital part of this is that not everybody bears uncertainty in the sense that entrepreneurs do. We say, you know, entrepreneurs bear uncertainty as if they're sort of shouldering a burden um, that other people don't want to carry. So that's what entrepreneurs do that makes them special. And the reason that they bear uncertainty in this way, the reason that they are responsible ultimately uh, for their decisions is because entrepreneurs own and use scarce resources. Right? And that's the difference between entrepreneurs and many of us as we sort of act in our everyday lives is that usually we're, you know, as we go about our, our everyday business, we are not devoting our, we're not hazarding our scarce resources um, in a business venture, say. Um, but this is the essence of what it means to be an entrepreneur is owning resources and, and you know, submitting them, putting them into production now in the hope uh, of obtaining an uncertain future reward. Right? And so this is where the other side of the, the, the profit coin comes in, which is the loss side. And this, again, is what uncertainty bearing is all about. It's about the fact that if you own assets, if you own capital, if you own land or you, you're borrowing labor, whatever it is, you're putting these things into the market economy in the face of uncertainty, you can always, you're always at risk of losing everything. This is why most people prefer not to be entrepreneurs. And this is also, as I say, it's, the, it's the, the flip side of profit, right, which is loss, right? That's what entrepreneurs earn that most other actors in the market economy don't earn, right? Most people don't earn profits or losses, right? Um, but entrepreneurs are, are uh, uniquely about this. And in fact, Mises, in one of his essays, says that if you want to figure out who an entrepreneur is, you find the person who suffers, the, who bears the burden, who suffers the financial losses, uh, when things go wrong, that's that's how you identify an entrepreneur, right? So this is if profits are the reward side, losses are the the sort of punishment side. You could say that consumers are punishing uh, entrepreneurs for making bad decisions, for getting it wrong, for incorrectly anticipating what consumers would want in terms of goods and services, right? So this is the this is as I say the the, the downside of this. Now, I just want to mention very quickly a few sort of implications of this, because uh, not just Mises, but other Austrians uh, have developed a, a variety of applications of this kind of thinking. Um, the first one, I think Per Bieland is going to talk about this a little bit more in his lecture on firms. Um, but uh, Mises makes a, a useful distinction between entrepreneurs and managers in this sense. And the idea here is that, again, because entrepreneurs own the assets, they own, say, the firm or the corporation or what have you, they bear that ultimate responsibility, um, and also that gives them the ability to delegate power to manager, managers, to delegate decision authority. So this is a useful way of understanding how modern firms and corporations come to be. It's a useful way of understanding how managerial hierarchies work by thinking in terms of the ultimate authority that entrepreneurs have that nobody else does. And that authority comes from their ownership of the, of the firm's assets, okay? Uh, another interesting one that, that Mises develops is a distinction between different types of socialism. So in the calculation lecture tomorrow, you'll hear, hear about how socialist economies essentially abolish the entrepreneurial function. Uh, but crucially, they do that in different ways. So you have socialism of the Russian pattern, by which Mises means like Soviet socialism, where you completely, where you formally abolish the market economy in a sense. So you, you, uh, abolish private ownership of the means of production, and thereby the entrepreneurial function essentially becomes sort of illegal, right? It's replaced by some kind of central planning. Uh, but Mises compares that to what he calls socialism of the German pattern, by which he basically means Nazism. And in that kind of a system, um, on paper at least, the entrepreneurial function is left intact. On paper, you're still allowed to be a private business owner and own your, your land and your labor and your capital and use them as you please. But in actual fact, you're actually, uh, you become a, basically a hired manager of the state, right? So on paper, you're still the property owner and you can still do as you please as an entrepreneur. But in fact, you're, uh, you're taking orders from, you know, the Nazi authorities or whoever's, uh, whoever's on top. Right. Um, so again, it's an interesting way to think about the difference between an entrepreneur and a manager who's ultimately giving the orders. 
Um, and then lastly, I'll mention very quickly the idea of ownership competence, which is a notion that's been developed by Peter Klein and Nikolai Foss and some others, um, which is a, another way of talking about entrepreneurial judgment and about how entrepreneurs use their assets um, and how they, uh, the skill with which they own assets. And one great application of this is in the public sector, um, because it's a great way of highlighting how once you talk about the public sector and government and so on, um, the entrepreneurial function, again, it sorts of starts to disappear or degrade, and it becomes a lot easier to see how, uh, you know, people acting within government or, you know, are themselves using scarce resources are a lot less likely to be skilled uh, at doing that um, and doing that, especially compared to, to market entrepreneurs. Okay, okay so. We talk about judgment a little bit, exactly what goes into judgment, what kinds of decisions are we talking about? And here again, it's great to go back to the source, to Menger. If you've never read Menger's principles, I strongly encourage you to do to, I strongly encourage you to, uh, because it's a terrific book. It's, I mean, even today, it feels very fresh. It's packed with all kinds of insights, including on things like entrepreneurship. Uh, and Menger, in his principles, develops a kind of typology uh, of different uh, different varieties of entrepreneurial action. And in a way, these are just ex different expressions of what we mean by entrepreneurial judgment. So things like obtaining information, uh, reading the external environment, as we would say, um, right all the way on down through, you know, organizing production, producing goods and services, and then supervising the business as it hopefully succeeds and moves into the future. All of these are essentially different types of judgments that entrepreneurs make, and all of them, as you can probably see, are fundamentally uncertain, right? Even the basic stuff like finding out information about your competitors and about the industry you're hoping to enter and so on, you can make all kinds of uh, errors about this. Um, and a lot of times entrepreneurs in the real world find out that if anything, they end up with sort of too much information, you know, a data overload. So they have to make all kinds of judgments of relevance about what data really matters, you know, what do I really need to care about when it comes to my competitors and things like this. So there's, it's all fundamentally uncertain. And as a result, it's fundamentally extremely difficult to be a successful entrepreneur over time. Uh, another point that I wanted to relate to this relates to a somewhat uh, a point that's often raised as a kind of a criticism um, of the concept of entrepreneurship in general, but also of the, the judgment-based approach to entrepreneurship. And that is the, the, the idea that really what entrepreneurship boils down to, it's just luck, right? Uh, you look at some entrepreneurs, they succeed, other entrepreneurs fail, and there's not really any you know, sort of decision making that you could point to in either case that would explain that. You know, on the one hand, you've got smart, successful people who are really driven, who just completely fail in business uh, for reasons that are completely outside their control. On the other hand, you have idiots who don't know how to use their money and are constant, you know, constantly making terrible decisions, and yet somehow they strike it rich and become ultra successful. So really, doesn't this just boil down to luck? And it's not really about decision making at all. And I think a good way of looking at this is it comes from uh, one of my favorite economist, the American Frank Fetter, um, who talks about this in his, uh, his uh, principles book. And he says, yeah, sure, like we can look at entrepreneurial success stories. And we can say, yeah, luck played a role in that to, to some extent, right? Sometimes you do succeed based on factors that are genuinely outside your control and that you didn't really consider in advance. Okay? However, he says, if you really look closely, if you look at historical you know, cases, if you, you know, if you examine entrepreneurial success and failure empirically, what you usually find is that the element of luck is much smaller than it at first appears, and that actually judgment was, uh, had played a far greater role than it initially seemed, right? And uh, he, gives, he gives a good example of this, which is uh, sort of like, uh, he gives the example of the, the gold rush in America in the 19th century, um, where he says, yeah, sure, you look at one guy who, you know, works for a day on his claim and strikes it rich and finds gold. Uh, and you look at somebody else who works his claim for years and years and years and loses everything and never finds, you know, uh, never finds a flake of, of gold. And doesn't that seem like just luck, you know, and isn't that 
isn't that unfair, right? Um, but Fetter says, no, actually, because if you sort of zoom out and you look at the larger pattern of decision making, you will start to notice that the people who tend to be successful, especially repeatedly and over time, make different judgments than the people who, who tend to fail, right? And in the example, his gold rush example, he says, look, um, you know, the, the person who strikes it rich, yeah, it might seem like a luck that you find gold on that, you know, on that one specific day and on that one specific hill. But you had to have the good judgment to go where the gold is supposed to be, right? You had to relocate across the country. You had to buy tools. You had to, you know, stake out a claim, buy it and try, you know, speculating on whether or not value would come out of that. So even though whether you strike gold on a particular day might in some sense be luck, it is the end result of a long series of judgmental decisions that you had to make uh, that ultimately led to you being lucky, right? So this kind of blends into, you know, the sort of cliches that you hear about making your own luck and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of truth in that when it comes to business and to entrepreneurship. Um, to a large extent, um, you, you, make, you do make your own luck um, by carefully planning, by carefully judging the situation, by you know, trying to uh, estimate what happens in the future, and so on. Right. Okay, I only have a few minutes left, so I'm going to go quickly through the last uh, few issues here. Um, it would be remiss of me to talk about Austrian economics and entrepreneurship without saying something about Israel Kirzner. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Israel Kirzner, uh, he is retired now, but for, uh, for many decades, um, he was an Austrian who was writing some influential books and articles uh, on entrepreneurship in the Austrian tradition. Um, he was one of relatively few uh, PhD students that Mises had during his time um, at, uh, at NYU. Um, and today, Kirzner is, I would say, the most, the best known Austrian when it comes to writings on entrepreneurship. Uh, but the reason I haven't talked about him so far is that uh, his approach to entrepreneurship is a bit different um, than the one that I've been discussing uh, up to this point. And if you compare his works to some of those early Austrians whose pictures I had up, um, you will see that very often Kirzner is a bit of an odd man out um, when it comes to his views on what entrepreneurs do. Um, and uh, in that sense, there's a kind of ironic, I think, quality to the fact that he has become very successful and very well known as an Austrian who writes on the theory of entrepreneurship. Um, so, but, uh, but setting that aside, let me just try to say something quickly about what his views are, and then I'll mention some of the controversies around them. So I said that uh, the theory of entrepreneurship starts with income distribution and trying to figure out what causes profit and loss, right? For Kirzner, uh, the importance of entrepreneurship is all about in figuring out uh, market coordination. So, so Kirzner's goal, his project in economic theory, is to try to explain how it is that markets coordinate themselves. Essentially, what he means is how supply and demand coordinate and how the market economy tends to move towards some kind of equilibrium, right? Because by definition, once you, when you get to equilibrium, the gains from trade are exhausted. Uh, basically, everybody's welfare is, is maximized. And that's what Kirzner wants to explain, is why the market economy has this tendency to constantly improve human welfare. It's constantly making people better off. And why, therefore, it is a superior method of economic organization in comparison to, to all others, you know, whether it's socialist command economy or, or whatever. Right? So, the way he does this is through his theory of entrepreneurship. And Kirzner's idea is that what makes entrepreneurs unique is that they are alert to profit opportunities. So a profit opportunity is just some kind of discoordination that happens in the world. It could be that there's a resource that's being underused. It could be that there's a potential for, you know, for a new product that people just haven't recognized yet. It could be something as simple as just a, a price difference that opens up the possibility for arbitrage. Opportunities are a very big umbrella. And the idea for Kirzner is that um, these are gaps that are created in the, uh, in the market economy that entrepreneurs then fill um, by essentially by being alert to them. So the idea is that entrepreneurs uh, tend to notice things that other people tend to miss. So entrepreneurs tend to be alert, as Kirzner says, to the existence of these prop, uh, opportunities. Then they stumble upon them serendipitously, um, sort of as if by luck. Uh, and by doing so, by discovering them, they then fill the gap um, and move the market to, uh, into a, a more coordinated direction, move it toward an equilibrium, and move it towards an increase in, uh, in uh, consumer 
welfare. Right? So the crucial element behind all of this for Kersner is the idea that the market economy tends to move in this direction. It tends to move toward coordination. If profit opportunities exist, as they do uh, all around us in the world, entrepreneurs are going to tend to discover them in a sort of a systematic way, right? And there, this is how Kersner establishes his overarching argument that the market economy is sort of welfare maximizing and that it's the best available economic system there is, okay? Okay, so there are a few objections, however, to this, to, to sort of Kersner's style of thinking that I'll just run through very quickly. Um, on the one hand, Kersner tends to theorize at a very high level of abstraction. His entrepreneur isn't really a real human being. It's really more of just like a, it's a, a conceptual wraith. I think that was what Rothbard called it at some point. Um, it's sort of a disembodied economic function that doesn't uh, really tell us anything about how actual businesses work. Um, on the other hand, um, although Kersner has an explanation of where profit comes from, because it comes from recognizing profit opportunities, he doesn't have a good explanation of where entrepreneurial losses come from. And the reason is that he, he argues strongly that entrepreneurs don't own assets. So that is not a part of the entrepreneurial function. And nothing ventured, nothing lost. So as a result, entrepreneurs in Kersner's system can always make profits but they can never really incur financial losses because they're not risking anything in the market economy. Okay. Next, um, some people have argued that unlike judgment, uh, what Kersner calls alertness really seems to boil down to luck, right? Um, and I mean, Kersner calls it serendipity himself. Um, and this in turn creates a number of issues for him because uh, for instance, it's very difficult to argue that there's a tendency for entrepreneurs to discover valuable opportunities if, it, if it's really just about luck. How, how does this happen in any kind of a systematic way if we're all just kind of stumbling upon opportunities all the time? So this is another sort of a line of argument that's been raised. Uh, and then last, I will mention that um, there's a long-standing debate between uh, Kersnerians and especially people who are interested uh, 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 influenced by the economist Joseph Schumpeter um, about whether or not the market actually is equilibrating in some sense or whether it's disequilibrating. So the Schumpeterians take the view that actually entrepreneurship discoordinates the market. Um, you know, the, the modern term for this, you know, I'm sure you've heard is disruption, right? Um, the idea that entrepreneurs actually disrupt the status quo, they disorganize the economy, discoordinate it. Um, so this debate was actually, it was really big in the 80s, but it pops up uh, inter intermittently now and again, and a lot of people have written about it. Um, but I will mention in passing that for Austrians um, of the you know, especially Misesian Austrians of the kind that I've been discussing, this debate is kind of beside the point because what matters from a Misesian perspective for the most part is whether or not there is a profit and loss test in the economy. Profit and loss is this crucial mechanism for filtering successful from unsuccessful entrepreneurs. It gives us a direct indication of whether or not entrepreneurs are doing a good job of forecasting the future. Because if you do it well and you satisfy consumers, they pay you, they pay you lots of money. And if you do it poorly, uh, they refuse to pay you. And eventually you earn losses and you go bankrupt. So the profit and loss test constantly works towards increasing and improving human welfare by rearranging the, the pattern of ownership in society. Because eventually, if you make losses and you go bankrupt, you have to give up your assets and they go to more, some other entrepreneur who does a better job of satisfying consumers. So this, from a Misesian perspective, is the more important issue. Whether or not there's this like overarching tendency toward equilibrium or not, this is not so important um, uh, for, the, for the most part. Okay. Last major topic I wanna to talk about is to zoom out a little bit uh, and look at the big picture of the entrepreneurial role in society and talk a little bit about what we could call the sociology of entrepreneurship. And here, um, uh, I mentioned Joseph Schumpeter a minute, I'll get onto him in a second, uh, but I wanna begin with uh, a couple of ideas from Friedrich von Wieser. Now, Wieser was one of the founding Austrians. Uh, he doesn't get talked about a lot very much anymore, mainly because he was a, he was a rather eclectic scholar. Uh, he wrote mainly in economics, but um, his, his intellectual love was always in history and sociology and so on. And he was really a pioneer of what we could call Austrian sociology. 
Um, so I just want to mention a little bit about this um, because I find it sort of um, interesting and, and provocative in a way. So Visa takes uh, very much the romantic view uh, of entrepreneurship that I mentioned at the beginning. So in a way, we come full circle back to people like the Elon Musks of the world um, because Visa described entrepreneurs as the, the bold technical innovators, the, the organizers with a keen knowledge of human nature, the far-sighted bankers and the reckless speculators in the world conquering directors of the trusts, right? So a very uh, uh, dramatic, if not melodramatic way of, of describing what it is that entrepreneurs do. But Visa built this, um, actually I'll come to that in a second. Visa built this into a whole sort of sociology of the entrepreneur. And in his last book, which was published in 1926 before he died, called The Law of Power, he uh, explores in great detail the social significance of entrepreneurship in society. And he argued that basically all societies need some kind of strong, charismatic, persuasive leadership uh, to sort of run them or organize them. And in the modern industrial society, that, uh, that agency is capitalist entrepreneurs. Right? So Visa assigned them a crucial social role um, in uh, basically organizing uh, all of society. And they do this by the use of persuasion. Usually it's persuasion to get consumers to buy whatever they're selling. Uh, but he makes a really important point, a very sort of Adam Smithian point, that unless you have good institutions, um, unless you have things like strong property rights, uh, you know, or as Smith would say, you know, peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice, without those good institutions, entrepreneurial persuasion goes wrong very quickly because entrepreneurs very soon learn in the face of weak institutions that they can use their persuasive skills outside the market economy. For instance, in politics to give themselves more power uh, or to influence legislators to grant themselves monopoly privileges, to punish their competitors through regulation and so on. So I bring this up because I think it's a very interesting point and I would argue that this is basically the first Austrian description of a sort of cronyism or crony capitalism or something like that. Um, so it's very, it's very interesting and provocative. I don't necessarily agree with everything Wieser says about this, uh, but he had a lot of uh, interesting ideas, uh, mainly that were picked up by Schumpeter. Now, Joseph Schumpeter was not an Austrian as such, but he was close to the Austrians in some ways. And he advanced this uh, theory of entrepreneurship and of capitalism um, that took a very pessimistic view um, of uh, what the future would hold for the market economy. Schumpeter argued that um, first, uh, capitalism is a process of creative destruction. It's a very famous phrase that he coined. And the idea is that in a capitalist market economy, you have a constant sort of cycle of creation and destruction as new businesses and new industries and new innovations uh, overpower and destroy the old ones, right? A constant process of sort of renewal and a constant process of getting rid of the old and bad and obsolete and replacing it with the new and the good and the uh, the exciting, right? So I'm sure you've heard many examples of this kind already, right? You know, when the you know the the personal computer completely destroyed the typewriter industry, right? Digital technology continually destroys analog technologies and so on and so forth, right? There's a million of these, right? Jonathan Newman destroys Patrick Newman and so on. Okay? <laughs> Uh, but what Schumpeter did with this was very interesting. And again, I don't really agree with, the, with his prognosis, but he argued uh, forcefully that eventually the capitalist market economy would go away. And the reason is that he thought that eventually we would figure out how to bureaucratize and how to, to routinize um, what entrepreneurs do, this process of constant innovation. Right? And one of the reasons he thought this is because he didn't really take account of uncertainty in the way um, that many of the Austrians did. So Schumpeter prophesied that eventually capitalism would be destroyed and replaced with a sort of socialist central planning system because eventually we would make entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial function completely obsolete. Right? So I don't really agree with his prognosis, but I mention it because it's an important argument and it's one that's come back again and again. And most recently it's come back in the discussions about things like AI. People want to know, can we just replace entrepreneurship with artificial intelligence? Um, can we you know, economize on our resources and avoid mistakes by using large language models to you know, sift through the data and make our decisions for us? And if you've been listening to anything that I've said in the past few minutes, uh, you'll know that Austrians, or you could guess that Austrians are very skeptical about this. Because what we've seen so far is that uncertainty is a lot more fundamental 
um, than, than a lot of the proponents of AI really give it credit for. And we don't really have any good reason to believe that things like large language models are actually capable of replacing the unique function that entrepreneurs perform in the market economy. Do I have any time left? I'm probably over time. So um, later in the week, I'll talk uh, in a seminar with my wife about different varieties of entrepreneurship in and around the market economy. So if you're interested in hearing more about this, please come along to this seminar. But with, not, I'm sorry for, with that, I'm sorry for going over time. Thank you so much for your attention.